U.S. Farm Report, a rural area public relations program brought to you in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation by members of the National Farmers Organization in this listening area and others interested in seeing the farmer receive a fair price for what he produces. Now here is Mr. Herschel Ligon, president of the Tennessee 4th Congressional District, NFO. Welcome to another NFO program from Nashville, Tennessee. NFO is a national organization of farmers who are determined to receive a fair price for what they produce. By fair price, we mean a price that will cover cost of production and give us a reasonable profit. Today we have a beautiful program, and when the camera gets off of me, you will agree. From Trigg County, Kentucky, Miss Mary Louise Jones. From Trousdale County, Tennessee, Ms. William Stone. From Sumner County, Tennessee, Mrs. James Womack. From Davidson County, Tennessee, Mrs. John J. Hooker, Jr. Our lead off later today is going to be Miss Mary Louise Jones from Trigg County, Kentucky. Miss Jones' father is president of the National Farmers Organization in Trigg County. She is a niece of Chuck Thomas, who is a very large farmer in Trigg County, a real strong NFO member, and has appeared on this program. Mary Louise, they tell me you are quite an NFO member. Tell us just what you want to about NFO. Thank you, Mr. Ligon. We're here now to discuss a rather mammoth problem, the plight of the nation's farmer. Uh, the success or failure of this man may well determine the success or failure of our country as a whole. So the farmer has problems. Well, we've heard this for a long time. Farmer has problems. Well, we need a criteria to sort of evaluate and see why the farmer's in the position that he's in. Is it his fault? Has he been a victim of circumstance? What factors are acting upon the farmer to force him to be the way he is? Now, in any business, whether it be farming or something out in the real business world, you have to be willing to meet certain things. In other words, you have to be efficient in your business. You have to be willing to take a risk. You have to work long and hard hours. And you have to invest before you will have anything uh, coming back in return. Now, let's look and see if the farmer is doing his job along these lines. One of the things I mentioned, does the farmer have enough invested. Now, for you farm people, you certainly know the answer to that. But some of you might, might not. But if you go out and price some, some land, some good land that you can raise some crops, or go down to the implement dealer and just see how much one of those new diesel tractors cost, or just think of all the pieces of equipment that you're going to need for your farm operation, and you'll see that the farmer has a great deal of money invested. Usually, when you think about people that have invested a lot for their jobs. You think of the professional people, such as doctors and lawyers, and certainly we don't mean to take anything away from them. They have invested a great deal. But look how much the farmer has invested and how his salary compares with something like that. It just doesn't work out. Now, is it because uh, he doesn't take the risk, or is he chicken, shall we say, in some respects, not willing to go out on a limb? Oh, no. I think you'll agree that anyone who has to depend upon the weather for uh, a variable in their means of making a livelihood certainly has to take risk of all sorts. Well, now, here's one thing that a lot of people might um, have a question about. What about the farmer's efficiency? Is the farmer really efficient? Farm economists and people who claim to be farm experts have pounded this on the heads of all farmers. You've got to learn to be efficient. You've got to manage where you can produce more, and this is going to be the key to the problem. Well, now, I think you know the answer to that. We're twice as efficient as we used to be. Look how many bushels per acre we're getting from corn. Look how many, uh, well, the weight we're putting on hogs or something like that per day. That's wonderful. But if the price remains the same, we're just producing ourselves right back in debt, and we're not getting anywhere. Let's look at something else. Uh, I mentioned that you must put your heart in your work. You must work long and hard, and naturally, that this question almost borders on being ridiculous for most farm people because you know how hard that uh, farmers do work. Uh, farmers aren't asking for an easy way out, that they uh, 
not have to work hard. This is a part of it. But what we are asking that in return for what we put out, we get a fair price. Now we've looked at the same worn out questions that people have been looking at for years and it seems now that the farmer is not at fault. In other words, he's doing his share. The thing that seems to be the trouble is that farm prices are too low in, in the relation of the rest of the prices that we are expected to pay. You uh, might find that your prices of uh, some things are about what they were 10 years ago for your farm products, in some cases lower. And you know that you can't go downtown and buy the things like a car or uh, some machinery for the same price you did 10 years ago. In fact, I have some figures here that uh, show over a 14-year peri uh, 14 period from 1950 to 64. They show that the food expenditures per person in the United States has increased from $312 to $417. Now that is a $105 increase. And you know where it went? $104 went to the marketing firms and the farmer got a dollar. Now that's less than 1% of this rise went to the farmer, less than 1%. So when the lady goes to the market and sees the high prices, the farmer is not the villain. Now, maybe you think, well, all right, so farming, um, so they're in trouble. What's the point of this for the whole nation to be worried about? Well, it's really something that goes a lot deeper than just farmers and something that we all should be concerned about. We've been living in a sort of fool's paradise. We've been just like Rip Van Winkle. We've been asleep for twice as long and just as sound, but we've got to pull our heads out of the sand and stop acting like an ostrich. We're the only people that can save ourselves. I'd like to uh, quote to you some things from Mr. Arnold Paulson, who is a research analyst from Minnesota. He's an all-around businessman who has done a great deal of independent research. He is chairman of the Committee for Rural Economic Survival. And these are some of the things that he has said about America's economy as a whole. Right now, we are brainwashed into thinking that this is the most prosperous time in the world for America. And that our, you know, everything's great. And certainly we do, we hear this from the newspapers, from the radios, magazines, they tell us how much we're producing. Yes, that, that's wonderful. But look at your areas which are dying, your rural towns that just seem like they just fade away, just sort of dry up and blow away. Well now, when something like that has happened, you see that your economy is not quite balanced. And we're not quite as well off as, as we think we are. We are producing more goods, but here's the key. With what are we buying these goods? Usually it's borrowed money. Sure, America's prosperous. America is so prosperous that we can't pay our medical bills, so we have Medicare. We're so prosperous that we can't uh, educate our own children, so we have federal aid to education. We're so prosperous that the industrial areas can't clean up their own slums, so we have urban uh, renewal and urban development. Did you know that in 1964, 50 cents out of every dollar that was spent in America was borrowed money? Now this can't go on forever. We're riding on the top of a crest. The only thing is that the inside is hollow. Now, it seems that if this is the problem, that there has to be some answers somewhere. And Mr. Paulson does uh, point to some answers. He tells us that uh, one thing is the key in the farming situation. We've got to learn to do something for the farmer. He's done something for the rest of us, so it should be time that we do something for him. But actually, what the farmer would like better than anything else is to do things for himself. And Mr. Paulson reports that there's one way that we can do this, and that's to organize. Your corporations and things are organized. The thing that's been killing the farmer is this attitude of taking your goods, driving up to the market, and saying, what will you give me to the fellow? You're at his mercy. You don't go to the shoe store and you go in, you see a pair of shoes you'd like, and you'd say, I'd like those, and the storekeeper says, uh, well, okay, well, you take for it. That's not the way it works. He says they're 1095, and if you don't have 1095, you don't get them. Well, we shouldn't be content to do the marketing the way grandfather did it. We're going to have to learn that organization is the key. NFO 
is a new organization, relatively speaking. And many times you've probably heard a farmer say something like, well, you know, we really should organize. We should get together, all of us band together in our efforts. And this is true. And what sort of organization would a farmer need? He'd want something that only farmers can belong, because this is a farm problem, th that the members actually control. But more than this, farmers need an organization which will meet a need that has never, ever been met by anyone before. And that is a fair price for the products of the members. And this price would be a price that equals the cost of production, plus a reasonable, and I repeat, a reasonable profit. Now, this isn't all he wants. This is that a price must be won and held, and this price should be guaranteed under a contract. Now, people organize for economic reasons. They do it to get an increased profit or higher wages, and to protect that certain amount of economic ground that might have already been gained. These people are working in the same occupation and, and living and trying to enjoy what they're doing. And these people are winning. We must realize that if we are to survive, we will take the nation's economy with us. If we survive, so will the nation. But something must be done. The key is through organization. If we organize our production, and production is the key, when we show the processors that we are able to furnish them with the needed amount of production, then they will be willing to sign our contracts and to guarantee us the price that is rightfully ours, the price that we deserve. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Louise. That was real good. As usual, I forgot something. I should have said that you are teaching language arts here in Davidson County at Antioch High School. I think they're most fortunate to have you out there, too. Thank you. We have uh, Ms. William Stone from Trousdale County. Her husband is the only president the NFO in Trousdale County has had. They have two daughters, and they have 500 acres. Ms. Stone is going to tell us just what a farmer's wife does on a farm of that size. Mary Elizabeth? Thank you, Herschel. I'd like to start off by quoting an old proverb. I'm sure you've all heard over and over, a man's work is from sun to sun, and a woman's work is never done. And if you've ever followed the footsteps of a farm wife, I think you would find this would be an understatement of the world. I feel the housewife is the backbone of the home. And the most important of her duties are homemaking. And a good housewife, duties vary greatly from everyday duties of washing and ironing, cooking and sewing, to driving a tractor. The biggest problem today is providing proper food, clothing, and education for the family-type farm. No one realizes the price squeeze on the farmer more than the housewife. First, the cost of production has to be paid. The purchase of replacement of animals and necessary equipment along with the repayment of capital indebtedness. Then, the small amount remaining, if any, is left for we housewives. We have to feed and clothe our families and maintain the home. I think our biggest problem is very simple. It all boils down. We just don't get a fair price for what we offer for sale. The NFO is striving to help the farmer overcome this situation. Personally, I think we are feeling the effects, however some won't admit it. As the farm family works strictly as a team and pull together to get things done, I believe farmers as a whole can pull together with the NFO to do even greater things. I think we as farm housewives can do our share by playing a major part by attending the NFO meetings and your other speakings, taking part in all activities. 
We as housewives must realize, being the member of the farm family, that purchasing and purchasing most of the food and clothing, we are very aware of the continually increasing cost of living. And I think home management is most important <clears throat> and it's very important that the farm managing usually done by our husbands. We manage our food budget by freezing, canning, and curing a large portion of our meat. And this is all not easy work. Most of our clothing we make. I figure I'm, I have two daughters and I figure I save a third. If I can buy, why buy a dress for $15 when I can make three? This savings can be applied to the education of our children, or maybe to purchase that new long-wanted combine that has been needed for so long. This is only a few of the ways which we can help our husband. We cook for the extra hired labor. That isn't easy either. We gather everything from the garden or we're taken from the freezers, and it's hot weather and it's no fun. We, we bank, we make our bank deposits, we buy vet supplies, our, we buy equipment parts, and that isn't all. We usually wind up helping to vaccinate the cattle. One of our greatest assets, and that's one thing that I think you, that the women get credit for. They say a woman can't keep a secret. Well, this is a time to talk, girl. We should take advantage of every opportunity to help the farm organization that can be the most help to us. And that, I think, is the National Farmers Organization. We can talk to our neighbors about NFO. In my, in my uh, uh, neighborhood, we have a community club. We have home demonstration clubs. Anywhere you drop in for a cup of coffee, come on, let's talk about NFO. Don't ever underestimate the power of a woman. We can spread the news just about as fast as the radio. What will the NFO mean to me? Or what will it mean to you? It will simply mean better price for what we sell and in keeping proper relation with what we have to purchase. I intend to continue helping my husband in every way I can, and I will stand beside him to help make the greatest organization, the NFO, even greater. And now, the duties of a homemaker is knowing how to be conservative, to be a good cook, have patience, common sense, good management, be an understanding mother and have help in the problems of your children and be an understanding wife and a satisfied wife. I think it would be very gratifying to my husband to know that I was disappointed, that I wasn't disappointed, and when he's doing the very best he can. And also a little encouragement from the husband wouldn't help the housewife. I know Mary Elizabeth is does just about all this she's talking about because when I was up to see him the other day, she helped her husband strip tobacco all day long. We have uh, the present, uh, well, the, from Sumner County, the wife of the first president of the National Farmers Organization there. They have, she and James Womack have a grown daughter and a grown son. They farm a thousand acres over there. And uh, this wife has done like many other wives, including mine, she feels like the way we can get out of this economic situation is not only to be a housewife, but go get a job somewhere else. So she is a clerk for TVA. Ms. James Womack, or Rebecca, what do you think about the situation? Thank you, Herschel. <clears throat> I'm glad to have an opportunity to have something to say on this subject that we're talking about today. I'll answer your question in a, maybe a roundabout way, but first I want to say that most of us that were in business or farming back in the mid-40s know this same story that you're talking about very well. Uh, around that time in the 1940s, middle 1940s, farming looked real good. 
we had uh, 100 percent of parity and i'm no economist but it seems to me a uh, economic situation like this would be very good for the entire nation yet i've heard some prominent farm leaders say that 50 percent of parity is good enough for farmers in other words he's saying that uh, it's all right for the farmers to have just half the buying power as the rest of the organized economy well i of course we can't agree with that but soon after the after 1946 things seemed to take a different turn in the years that followed the picture changed very much the things that we farmers had to buy and the price that we received for our production became so out of balance that uh, the uh, his financial status took a sharp decline and here i have in mind farmers who depend solely on farming not those who might have inherited a large sum of money or, or received a large price for some land that they sold to governments for rural uh, for urban development or other purposes or farmers who uh, sort of farm on the side whose primary interest is professional industrial i'm talking about the people who actually uh, depend solely on farming for their living and when a situation like this is brought about and, and i say brought about someone might question that but i think something like that doesn't just happen it is brought about a and even an elementary school child can understand clearly uh, what the result the consequence is you don't uh, buy on a high sa scale and sell on a lower scale and stay in business at least not for very long every industrialist in this country can tell you the how essential sound business practices are but to get back to your original question about 15 years ago i went to town and assumed a full-time job in spite of the fact that as mrs stone pointed out as a farm wife and a business partner which your wife is on the farm i already had a full-time job but i did this for one reason that was to help to hold on to our farm in view of the situation that we were facing with uh, apparently uh, accumulating debts my husband and i felt like this was a wise decision to help as i would be able to by adding to the income now, in our part of the country in our immediate community in an area there where we have good fertile land we have about 33 farm farmers who um, own their farm and out of those 33 families 28 of the farm wives have gone to town and assumed a job just as i have done to help hold on to their farms and the mortgages <laughs> and to help educate their children and now at the present time after about 15 years of uh, having been away from my home it, and although our children are grown and married it would seem that uh, we could both let up a little and we would like to and i would enjoy very much being at home besides having satisfaction of knowing that i was feeling a real need my husband needs me there and i need to be there and that would be uh, true that we could do that except for one thing and that is that we haven't quite fully recovered from those years of more outgo than income now uh Herschel told you something about our operations and i mentioned this only to uh show you that the more you work and the more you um you bigger your operations it doesn't really uh, it doesn't ensure you being able to be feel secure on having sufficient income we fatten out uh, pigs to fall the market from about 150 hogs and we have a good many cattle and also sheep and we both uh, my husband works very hard at it but even in spite of this I think that uh, speaking for myself no farmer really has any illusions about getting rich I don't not that they would object to the idea of a little wealth but I don't think they have any illusions about really getting rich I think what they really want to do is to be able to pay their bills and enjoy perhaps a fair share 
of the good things of life over and above the bad necessities of life. Rick, I have another question. I have a question I want to get to you in a few minutes. Let me talk to one of our other guests, and I have a, a loaded question for you. I'd like to make a statement before I introduce our next guest. Uh, she is the wife of the unsuccessful candidate for the primary uh, uh, nomination for governor of this state in the recent election. And I want to make this statement to everybody. The day after he was defeated, his strongest opposition made the statement that four years from now, if he wants to run for governor, there's nobody in the state of Tennessee that can beat him. Uh, Ms. Hooker, you've heard us cry about the farm situation. You've heard NFO and this, that, and the other. I have a loaded question for you. I invited you because I didn't think you knew anything about NFO. I didn't think you knew anything about farming. I wanted you to hear us cry, and then I was going to throw this question at you. Uh, I know you have three children. I'm sure you do a lot of entertaining, so I imagine your grocery bill is reasonably large. I want to ask you this question. Would you be willing to pay a fair price for groceries, provided we farmers got a fair price for what we produce? Well, first of all, let me say that uh, unlike these ladies whose husbands or families are daily involved in farm problems, being married to a lawyer and to a politician, I, of course, am not as aware of the problems as they are. Uh, being a mother of three small children and having a husband and having to feed them, uh, I must admit that when I do go to the groceries and I reach up on that shelf to get down a box of uh, pablum or cereal, I don't stop and think about the farm price. I think about the food price. And I think, gosh, here this is cereal has gone up or the bread's gone up. Uh, so uh, I must say that uh, I really am not uh, aware of your problems, but after listening to you all today, one can't help but come away realizing that the squeeze is and has been put on the farmers. And uh, as an honest citizen, I must say that I think you all are being mistreated and that as a housewife, I do feel that uh, I certainly would not mind paying more for a product as long as I thought the farmer was getting his fair share of the, of the price. Now I have another one for you. You know, it's much easier when you're on the outside to look inside and see what's going on than it is when you're surrounded by your problems. And lots of times, as they say, you can't see the woods for the trees. You have heard our problems, and no doubt you're uh, campaigning for John Jay. Uh, uh, you can pick this thing up readily. What would you recommend is the best way for us farmers to get out of the situation we're in? Well, I'm, sh I'm sure everybody would like to be able just to put their finger on one thing and say that was the solution. But uh, I believe after listening to the ladies today, I believe that the only choice you all have is to band together and organize a group such as the NFO, which has, you know, is a organization, but it's just, it's, it's just in the very beginning. And uh, I think the farmers have to go out and, uh, and uh, such people as you, Mr. Ligon, and try to enlighten the other farmers and the farmers, house wa farmers wives and show them that uh, other groups are organized, lawyers are, doctors, manufacturers, so why not you all? And I believe that you will find that this would probably be the most beneficial way to help your, help your people. Ladies, I'm positive this has been a beautiful program. I want to make this one statement before we close. We in NFO know everybody will be for NFO when they understand it. Thank you very much. You've been wonderful. U.S. Farm Report, a rural area public relations program, was brought to you in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation by members of the National Farmers Organization in this area and by others interested in seeing the farmer receive a fair price for what he produces. <laughs>